morning, everyone. I'm APFA National Vice President Larry Salas. It's our pleasure to have you join us today for APFA's quarterly membership meeting. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Our quarterly membership meeting uh, is an excellent opportunity for us to update our membership on topics from each of our department chairs uh, that uh, directly pertain to your day-to-day -day work life, uh, including a presentation uh, from our contract action team. So uh, we will uh, start the meeting uh, with a presentation from our contract action team. And Todd Smitala. Oh, sorry. It's not, it's not Todd. I apologize. It is Kai. Kai will be doing the presentation for the contract action team. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, so uh, my name is Kai Kemmels. I'm one of the contract action team uh, admins. I'm an ambassador in Philadelphia base. Um, this quarter, the contract action team staged our third successful system wide two hour long picket across all 10 bases on the 4th of April. Uh, as with the recent past pickets, we hosted close to 2,000 participants altogether, including not only American Airlines flight attendants, um, but also members of our industry sister unions and work groups. Uh, this picket aligned with the schedules of a lot of senators and state representatives we contacted, um, along with the help from our government affairs department. Uh, many of these representatives were able to attend our pickets, um, including Massachusetts Senator Lydia Edwards and Representative Adrian Madaro in Boston, uh, California Representative uh, Nanette diaz Barragan in Los Angeles, and uh, Pennsylvania Representative Daniela Burgos in Philadelphia. Uh, we did receive a lot of responses from several others who were unable to attend, um, but are wanting to help APFA flight attendants in our negotiations process in uh, whatever way they can. So we look forward to working alongside them, um, along with the other unions, uh, more this year. And let me, <laughs> sorry, we're kind of juggling a little bit remotely here, so let me pull up the slides. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the contract action team is continuing to conduct our organized terminal walks in tandem uh, to extend outreach and visibility, uh, connecting with our members um, with the negotiations, um, keeping everyone updated and distributing supplies. Um, it's really positive and overall well-received uh, endeavor where we're able to um, just be a face-to-face -face, um, interaction with the other flight attendants on behalf of the negotiating committee. Um, but also present any feedback and discussion um, from flight attendants uh, to the negotiators and uh, sort of bridge that gap. Our next uh, scheduled terminal walk event will be on the 19th of May. It'll be on the 22nd in DC at Reagan, uh, likely with more to follow in June. We're currently organizing those dates. Um, you can see the updated uh, dates for each base on the APFA Instagram, um, and we'll be posting those and sharing them uh, shortly. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry again about the juggling, you'll have to forgive me. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So as far as the uh, supplies we're handing out, um, you, everyone's I think, <coughs> familiar with the red lanyards now. Uh, we also have um, mentioned earlier uh, some of the campaign items uh, include our new pride pins that we debuted last fall, um, the regular APFA pins, um, and each individual who is an APFA representative flight attendant um, was mailed uh, two luggage tags, um, which says we are ready and 25,000 strong, uh, mid-April. Um, those all went out to the addresses that are registered with the APFA website. Um, so make sure that you're keeping that information up to date. Uh, if you move addresses or anything, not just updating it with American Airlines, but you need to do it separately uh, with APFA and keep all of your information current. Um, on that note, when you do log in to the APFA website, uh, it's been updated now and we'll cover this uh, more later, but uh, you should be able to see your dues status. Um, if you do owe, uh, you can get in touch with the dues department, but that's going to be a big focus of contract action team is making sure everyone's in good standing um, so they're eligible to vote. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, well, covered a lot of that. Anyway, <laughs> so again, um, making sure you're signed up for everything, including the hotlines and negotiations updates. Um, the QR code on this slide will take you to the contract action team uh, sign up. 
If you've not already signed up, um, you'll get updates directly from your base ambassador um, about future events and ways you can participate. Um, this takes all of us. It's not just the same 12 to 15 people showing up. There's 26,000 of us now, and that's how you form a strong union movement um, is by getting a strength in numbers and everyone engaged. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Kai. I just want to remind everyone, we can't do this alone without you, right? And one of the uh, biggest things you can do to show your support and show the company is that you wear your APFA pin, your red lanyard, and attach those bag tags, the luggage tags to uh, your bags uh, to show the company we are ready for a contract. All right. And that I want to say includes our probation, probationary flight attendants. Um, so everyone should be wearing their union pin, their red, la red lanyard, and um, their the luggage uh, tag. Um, and again, if you uh, need a APFA pin, the lanyard, you can reach out to your base rep or you can reach out to membership here at APFA. All right, thank you. All right, let's uh, move on to safety and security with Andrew Reinhardt, our safety and security chair. Hey. How you doing, everyone? Uh, so got a lot of change happened with the new door closure procedure with the agents now closing the door. And now that we're entering late spring, summer, temperatures are on the rise across the system, and we're going to be seeing an uptick in hot cabin events. Also, SOF reporting. Now that acronym stands for smoke, odor, and fume. In our manuals, it's going to talk more about cabin odor, but when you fill out the report in a SIRS, it's still labeled as smoke, odor, or fume. Even though when we think of smoke, that's a totally different list of procedures, right? Might be a fire on board. But APFA Safety and Security is actively collecting this data especially surrounded the uh, changes to the door closure. There have been an uptick in injuries to gate agents, as well as they're not quite uh, in the know that the door closure procedure involves an FAR and that it could be a violation if those three Bs, the bins, bags, briefings, are not completed before door closure. So if you run into any issues with that, we ask that you please report that with the cabin ASAP report under generic or specific safety concern, as well as with the SIRS. And the topic with that, I would put operational uh, issues for that one. Um, uh, for hot cabin, same process. We ask that you use uh, cabin ASAP, and there is a, um, a topic for temperature, and then SIRS, operational issues, smoke odor fume, uh, has its own type of topic in cabin ASAP. Uh, it's a, I believe it is a fume event is what the topic is. And uh, SIRS will have a SOF smoke odor fume labeling. Now we have one other form for hot cabin. It's a, a hot cabin report form on the APFA safety web page. It's under the reporting section. This form is, in, is particularly important because we will receive the data from the other two reports, but this one directly comes to us in safety as well as other departments at APFA. We'll need that data. And I'm going to sound like a broken record about all the reporting, but it's so important for us that we collect this information so that we can advocate for changes and procedures. So I'm going to go into a little more detail about hot cabin. Often we're asked, what's the temperature that boarding has to stop or when can we stop boarding? Now, uh, per the IFM, Section 342, and you can find that in, um, I believe it's general boarding uh, procedures for boarding a, boarding a warm cabin. It says when flight attendants enter an aircraft, if cabin temperatures are already warm, do not wait until temperatures reach 90 degrees. Now, on Airbus aircraft, we have a panel 787, 777. We have a panel that, that indicates temperature 737. We don't. We don't know. Uh, some folks walk around with those little laser. Uh, um, thermometers, you know, that ones that we could do the back whenever we were all getting those to our forehead during COVID, and that's helpful. Uh, we're all working on trying to get some other things out to the membership to be able to uh, check cabin temperature. But if you are hot, and it is unbearably so, we uh, the procedures in the IFM indicate that you need to alert the cabin, a uh, flight deck, excuse me, and if they are not present, the gate agent. They have a list of procedures of their own to run checks on the auxiliary power unit to make sure they're operable or they will bring a maintenance individual out to come and start the APU, okay? Um, we have been pushing to have this 
be flight attendant discretion instead of a 90 degree threshold, which is way too dangerous because as we all know on a full aircraft, 85 will jump to 90 and then some and no problem during boarding. Management uh, insists that 90 degrees is a suitable temperature threshold. So again, I'm requesting that we have plenty of cabin ASAPs filed on this, serves reports and that APFA hot cabin report form. Right now, uh, the position that oversees policies and procedures and in flight um, has been recently filled uh, for a while it was vacant. And when that person takes over, our plan is to show up with plenty of data to support why these changes are made, especially in terms of flight attendants discretion sh should be our decision because we are safety professionals. We should be able to determine when it's safe or not safe to board an aircraft, especially due to the elevated temperature. Now, uh, ACM violations were going down for a while, which was a good thing until April 17th or April 30th, where we found 135 flight attendant alone violations and 61 from pilots. Now, these are ones that are actually investigated. Yesterday, I found out that there is a bot that runs every day. And what it does is it checks PNRs for crew members on international flights and then looks up KCM activity. And that number, Mainline alone from uh, say June of last year to May 9th of this year was 2,393 violations combined flight attendant and pilot mainline alone. Do all of those get investigated? No. Um, and then I want to say the year to date was 872. Dropping, still a problem. And so I genuinely believe that not everyone knows that they maybe have made a mistake because a lot of this is involving international travel. But the main thing that I want everyone to understand is that the system cannot differentiate whether you came in uh, from a domestic leg that day, you went through KCM, say it was Raleigh, Durham, ended in Miami, you went home, got a new bag, came back to the airport, and then went through regular security. It still shows that you went through KCM that day and the system will flag you. OK, and when that happens, we get a list sent out to us and there's a three um, step course that in flight management will take. First is a coaching council. Second violation is 90 day suspension. Third is a 12 month susp uh, suspension. So if you plan to travel internationally for personal reasons, you must utilize standard screening that entire day at the start. Say that you're doing that last leg out of Raleigh Durham, you need to start with standard screening at the beginning of the day, and then again, if you leave the airport and return, that's the best way to avoid a violation. And it's just, it's, I don't want anyone being pulled in for a coaching council or a 35R right now because of how tensions have been with management. It's just not worth it. And if you have any questions about KCM rules, you can go to the known crew member website. You can also ask us at a safety at APFA.org. Thank you, Andrew. Let's move on now to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, Rhonda Kirkwright will uh, begin that presentation. Rhonda. Hi, Hi everybody. Uh, we have a few things that are on our radar with DEI. Um, they've come directly from you, our flight attendant workforce. One is image standards. That's uh, something that we are talking about. Other airlines have made some changes. And particularly, I think we're probably looking at next step changes being uh, tattoos, being visible uh, piercings. Uh, that has already changed with uh, uh, the other big airlines and we're far behind that. We're actually behind the military and our armed forces when it comes to our image policy. So the next thing is social media. We've been working more with Paul and Laura, um, pushing our human rights, our social justice, uh, diverse, recognizing our diverse workforce through Instagram. I hope you guys all are part of that uh, social media AP, at APFA Unity and um, just hoping that we get more uh, awareness out there through that. We've been working with health benefits and with Kathy and where there might be improvements, um, specific areas with benefits and that would be uh, for example, are we considering different family structures? Uh, are we being more progressive in that area? For example, fertility treatment. Um, uh, infertility is defined as not being able to get pregnant after one year. And that 
definition determines who qualifies for fertility benefits. So we're really looking closely at that. There are other big companies that actually uh, recognize this. And so we'll be looking more into that. And we've been working with Allie and Lori on the Crown Act, and that's been very exciting. It has passed in a lot of states, correct, Allie? And uh, it passed the House of Representatives. Last session and not pass the Senate, correct? Okay, and so basically what the Crown Act is, it's creating a respectful and open world for natural hair that protects against any discrimination based on your hairstyle, hair texture, and um, such as braids, knots, twists. And so we are hoping that that makes some progress and that we can pick forward Ali and Lori helping us in that. Lastly, uh, we covered last month language discrimination. We've had flight attendants contacting us and saying that they've been treated differently based on uh, their accent and what language discrimination is. It is someone who speaks um, is discriminated against because of the characteristics of their speech, and it can be their accent. It can be the size of their vocabulary. It can also be the rhythm of their speech and syntax. And so we've had flight attendants contacting us and they are feeling that they're not getting uh, the support that they would like um, because maybe of their accent and treated differently. We're all certified as flight attendants. We all come out of training. We're all able to do all positions. And so we should be treated that way. And so we'll be looking more into that and looking for ways that we can support the flight attendants in that area. And all that's right. all I have. Thanks, Rhonda. All right, we will continue on now with Kim Tuck. Hey, everyone. And our retirement. Kim Tuck, I'm the retirement specialist here at APFA. And I have a couple of slides from our last board meeting that I wanted to share with the whole of the membership because some of these are our most popular slides when we do our retirement presentation. And we've been talking about our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've got diverse age groups um, and kind of comprising the demographics of our members. So I did a little uh, kind of went through all the years of our retirements and the flight attendant ages over the past five years and put together a little chart for everybody to see kind of how our membership's changing in terms of the ages of our flight attendant work group. And so it's interesting because people are always asking me, it's, are people retiring? If you look at the um, overall retirements, and I'll show you that in the next slide, Nearly a quarter of our membership numbers have retired in the last five years. So people are retiring, but we're hiring like crazy and it's kind of filling in the gaps. And if you look at the numbers, you see the biggest increase um, is in the 30 to 39 age group. So from May of 2018 through January of 2023, um, it's, we've had a significant increase in that age group, pretty much doubled. And then the biggest decrease is the 50 to 59 age group. Um, funnily enough, even though I didn't put it on the slide, the biggest percentage increase is the 80 to 89 <laughs> year group. We had five flight attendants that age in 2018. And now, um, as of the beginning of this year, we had 20 flight attendants in the 80 to 89 age group. So here's some takeaways from this uh, little chart. and. Um, I'll kind of go through it. So retirements overall from May 2018 to January of 2023, we had 4,843. This is equivalent to approximately 20% of the January 2023 headcount. So that's a significant number in the last five years. Um, it's important to note that the above number doesn't include resignations and terminations. So there's actually even more people kind of coming in and out of the work group as we go along. Uh, the headcount for January of 2023 is 1,279 flight attendants less than it was in May of 2018. This indicates that all the hiring we're doing is kind of making up the gap, like I mentioned before, barely enough to cover all the retirements since 2018. So 
pretty significant that we're hiring that much and we still have pretty much the same head count as we did five years ago. All right, so also with, you know, kind of our negotiations going on and we're feeling a lot of stress from the company and some people are calling me and complaining about feeling like they're being nitpicked a little bit by their managers about attendance and maybe some random tweet from a premium customer that doesn't really reflect how they've done their job for the last 30 years. Um, I have quite a few people asking me how to retire quickly. So I wanted to kind of do a retirement in a nutshell slide. What do you need to think about if you want to retire really, you know, in the next three to 30 days, three months to 30 days. So here are the main things you need to think about. Number one, you need to think about money. If you're going to retire, you still need to pay the bills. Um, so you want to think about your income and in retirement. Um, possible sources of retirement income would be your pension if you have one, um, your 401k, which everybody has, social security if you're old enough for that, if you have any outside investments, perhaps a second career, if you're retiring because of an injury or an IOD, um, or maybe just a personal illness, you could be eligible for disability if you have that coverage, or social security disability. Also, another option would be help from your family, you know. So these are things to think about possible sources of income if you're going to retire quicker than you, you know, planned on or just quicker than maybe a lot of people who take, you know, six months to a year to plan it out. Um, the next thing you need to be thinking about for everybody is their health insurance. So for some people, it might be Medicare. COBRA would be offered when you retire, but that's not an option if you're Medicare eligible. Um, if you're not wanting to pay the COBRA cost, but you still need coverage, you would look on the Affordable Care Act website for options there, or you could go on your spouse's benefits, or if you're still young enough, perhaps you could go on your parents' benefits. And last but not least, you need to notify the company. And that's really the last thing you do once you've figured out your income, you know, component and your health insurance component. And the company only requires two weeks notice. Um, usually most people give between 30 days and two weeks notice prior to their um, retirement. And the main thing you need to do, there's not really retirement paperwork. You just notify your flight service manager that you're going to retire and they will want to know when is your last day as an active employee and when is your first day as a retiree. So that's pretty much retirement in a nutshell. If you want to delve deeper, we have a lot of good information on the retirement page of the APFA website and in our retirement packet titled Good Slide. So thanks very much and uh, contact me at retirement at APFA.org if you've got any questions. Alrighty. Thank you, Kim. All right, let's move on to uh, health. And uh, sitting in for Kathy Sharp uh, today is Amber Clement. Hello, I am going to go over the maternity process today. We've had quite an influx of uh, pregnant placements over the last year or so. And so we thought this information would be pretty helpful for those of you that are currently pregnant or it's something you're thinking about in the future. So the first thing that you will do when you find out you're pregnant is you're going to submit a proof of pregnancy to the company. Um, you will create a maternity case on absence tracker. And then once you get that note with a proof of pregnancy from your doctor, you can either upload uh, that note to absence tracker yourself or your doctor can fax it directly over to the absence and return center. If you do uh, want to work while you're pregnant, you have the option to use the maternity sick call recode. And what that means is that if you uh, do have to call in sick for a trip due to pregnancy related reasons, um, you can recode that absence so that you don't get any punitive action taken against you. Um, it will use your sick time if you have that available, but you won't get any attendance points for that sick call. And so how you're going to do that is you're going to go on to comply 365 and open up the maternity intermittent sick recode request and complete that. And then once that's done, they will recode your sick call to the maternity code as opposed to a sick call. 
The policy for American is that they will allow two consecutive months of intermittent sick, sick recodes. Um, but just be uh, cognizant of those sick calls. The company does have the opportunity to say, hey, um, we need you to be written out for the duration of your pregnancy if they feel like they have been generous enough with the recodes. If your doctor does recommend that you get removed from duties prior to delivery, you will create another case on absence tracker for a medical leave. And then once your doctor sends that documentation over to the absence and return center, they will recode your schedule to an M2 or an M3 coding um, for the duration of your pregnancy. And just remember, they will run FMLA concurrently with that leave um, if you do go out uh, prior to birth. Once your baby arrives, you'll want to contact MetLife and the Absence and Return Center to notify them of the birth of the baby. Um, once that uh, leave has been processed, they will code your schedule as an M5. Um, MetLife will be the administrator of your maternity disability pay, so you definitely want to make sure you contact them as soon as possible so they can get your payments to you uh, quickly. You do get about six to ten weeks of maternity disability. It just depends on what your healthcare provider sends over to MetLife. And then once your paid disability time is over, you can utilize the uh, remainder of your 180 days from the date of birth as a personal leave of absence. And that is an unpaid personal leave of absence. Um, just a reminder, during that time, you will not have uh, active rates for benefits. They will make you pay the full rate. So that's just something to keep in mind if you do want to take a uh, part of this personal leave of absence. And you will make that request by going to the maternity, maternity personal leave of absence form on Comply 365 and make that request. And then you'll see an M for coding on your schedule once that's been approved. If you have any other questions, you are free to email or call the health department. And all this information is also on the APFA website um, under the health department and on the flight service website. All right, perfect. Thank you, Amber. Appreciate all that information. Moving on now to contract and scheduling with uh, Marty and, and Jack. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, we have noticed after PBS processes that we get a lot of phone calls with flight attendants who don't understand why they have been uh, scheduled to fly on certain days. And so we wanted to talk about coverage needed days because we think that maybe that's not really fully understood. So uh, a coverage needed day is basically a day that you're required to fly due to your juniority, basically, uh, because it does go in seniority order and the more senior you are, the less likely you are to have a coverage needed day. Uh, the more junior you are, the more likely you are to have several coverage needed days. So um, weekends, holidays, month to month transition days, all of those are gonna drive coverage for coverage needed days. Um, we cannot predict what the coverage needed days are going to be until after PBS processes or starts to process because it, we have to see what everybody's bidding to have off. Uh, we have lots of hotlines out there, though, that we have done uh, with coverage needed days that can help you predict what the coverage needed days would be at your seniority or especially with July 4th coming up. You can look to see were you required to fly over July 4th. But we do a report every single month based on this report that we get from the company. Uh, this is a very condensed report that we're hoping that we'll be loading up to the APFA website so that everybody can check coverage needed. And on um, this form, what you can do is just look at your base and then look at the date, and then you have the, the seniority number of the most senior person that was required to fly on that day. So that really does help to kind of narrow it down, especially um, for instance, for May, we had two holidays. We have Mother's Day and we have um, Memorial Day weekend. So it generated the need for a lot of coverage needed because everybody was bidding to get basically the same um, the same days off. The other report that we get from the company is a report like this and it lists, this is just a little snippet of, of one base and uh, it lists every single line holder and every single reserve in seniority order and the date that they were given coverage needed days. So obviously this report is about 45 pages long um, that looks just like this. So what we do is we go in and we consolidate this list and just start with the seniority number 
of the uh, per of the date that corresponds. So in this case, if you look at reserve, uh, they were required. The most senior person was 3557 seniority, and they were required to fly on May 26. And then as it goes down, it keeps getting more and more uh, junior <laughs> and then more and more dates. And so by the time you get to the bottom, you can see that the people at the bottom of the seniority in that base were required to cover a bunch of dates. Um, sometimes I think there was like 18 over Christmas. We've seen people required to, to cover 20. Obviously, that can't happen because you do get days off. But it does help to kind of show how many days were actually required for coverage at that seniority day. Legalities will always come before seniority. So speaking to that, when you see somebody at the bottom of the seniority list that's required to cover, say, 16 days, they can't fly 16 days in a row. So they have to have days off, which is why sometimes you will see that there might be somebody junior to you holding a day off that you requested. Uh, we see that a lot with January 1st. Uh, senior people all want to have January 1st off, but when you have straight reserve, where people on reserve the last six, seven days of uh, December, and then flying to cover the holiday in January, they have to have days off somewhere. So over that span of time, can't have them be on call for 10, 12 days straight. So they're going to get a couple of days off there, and you may see somebody that's junior to you holding a day off that you wanted, but that's because they had to have a day off. Uh, I already talked about May having some, several issues with coverage needed. Uh, so we wanted to show everyone where would you find those on your PBS award. And we provide these in the hotline, but when you click on your layer tab under your award, if you have coverage needed dates, it'll say coverage needed, and then it will list all the dates that you were required at your seniority to fly over those dates. And this is uh, your uncle. We did want to talk one other thing because we're still seeing issues with reserve bidding in PBS. If you're on reserve, always, always, always make sure you're bidding under the reserve tab. And the clue that you're on the right tab will be that you're going to have a calendar with little numbers in the bottom right corner. Those numbers are a suggestion, or that's a company want, basically, of how many reserves they would like to have available on that day. It's kind of their wish list of how many people they would like to have. Uh, they're just a projection. Uh, requirement and uh, don't always count on that number. If you're senior to that number, that that's going to require you to be, or that's going to allow you to be off on that day. Uh, the problem with it is if you see that there's uh, 250 people required on a day and you're 276 um, on the seniority list, you know that there's 250 people junior to you. Remember, those people all have to have days off too. So sometimes legalities will interfere with your ability to get a day off that you really want. Jeff is up. All right, um, we're gonna move on to a couple other topics. We just wanted to remind um, all flight attendants of the ability to create a generic UBL ballot. In addition to being able to bid for specific trips, we just wanna talk really quick about uh, the ability to create a generic UBL ballot. When you go into TTS, the TTS system, their daily bids, you um, click on add request to ballot, and then you would click on the UBL generic bid pickup button. And I'm going to just show you an example. Um, this is me I'm based up in New York. So let's say, for example, that I want to fly tomorrow. I want to pick up a trip in UBL flying tomorrow, um, and I want it to be an easy two day trip. So I put in my criteria for, and I like late sign in. So I put in a criteria for reporting no earlier than noon. Um, and then I wanted um, a two day trip. So releasing on the 13th, the day after tomorrow, sometime between 7 a.m. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give me a trip that's super early in the morning, but um, arriving no later than 6 p.m. on day two. Um, in this case, I put my co-terminal uh, preferences at LaGuardia and JFK. Um, I, I do not want to go to Newark, so I'm only going to click the, the co-terminals that I wish to fly out of. And I, I also have the option to uh, let the system know that I only want to be awarded red flags. So if I'm looking for a red flag trip tomorrow, I can say only red flag sequences and the system would only award me if the particular 
the criteria for the trip that I'm looking for comes up and it's a red flag sequence um, because I'm very, you know, I'm, I want to narrow it down to two duty periods. I'm not looking for any sort of turn, you know, because you can have turns that cover two calendar days. Um, I want to make sure that I'm uh, designating that I want two duty periods. So that's the min two, max two. And then I want to make sure that it's no more than one leg per day. So I've I've kind of used my generic ballot, but I'm rather using rather specific criteria to lead the system to what it is that I want to do on that particular day. I um, also wanted to point out, so when you're when you add criteria at the very bottom of the criteria, if I want to be considered for a, an ODAN or a red eye sequence, I need to make sure that I I select those criteria because otherwise the system will not automatically award me a red eye or an ODAN if I haven't um, <coughs> selected those particular criteria. Um, some additional UBL tips. It is okay to bid for specific sequences in UBL, um, but if you do, we also recommend adding a generic ballot that matches the criteria for the specific sequence you are balloting uh, for. This is because sometimes crew scheduling, things will happen to a particular trip and crew tracking may repackage it and it'll have essentially be the same trip, but it might have a different sequence number. So if I bid specific that specific sequence at that sequence number and they change the sequence number, it's no longer, you know, that that my bid is for that sequence number. So I can add the additional generic ballot to ensure that if, if for some reason the sequence number gets changed, that I can still be awarded um, that trip. All right. Um, moving on to another topic really quick, we want to talk about wrap assignments. Um, we see this come up occasionally if a flight attendant is mid sequence when rota processes for the following day. And the language in the JCBA that kind of touches on this is in um, hours of service, section 11, reserve, um, section 12, and international, section 14. Um, FOSS is programmed to read projected arrival time when processing ROTA awards and assignments. So what that means is, you know, you let's say your scheduled arrival time is 10 p.m., but in FOSS, the system knows that your flight is going to arrive early it may it, it can assign you a wrap based on the earlier projected arrival time. Um, so this can make you essentially legal for a wrap that is um, that is that you would not be legal for based on your scheduled arrival time. So if you are given a wrap assignment based on projected actual and your scheduled arrival time would make you illegal for the assigned wrap, you may be moved to the next full wrap on the same calendar day. So to take care of that, what you would do is call scheduling to make the request with one hour of your debrief for, from that trip. And scheduling will review to the next wrap as long as um, there is a, um, there's not a, it doesn't create a situation there where there are more trips than available um, reserves in that wrap. So just those are the two things we wanted to touch on today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jeff and Marty. OK, we will continue on to IOD now with uh, Valia Pexen, our national IOD chair. Thank you, Larry. Um, good morning, everybody. And I guess good afternoon for some. Um, what I'd like to talk, talk about today is maintaining your AA benefits and optional coverages while you're out on an IOD. But first, I wanted to touch up with uh, what Cedric, the workers' comp, uh, what workers' compensation insurance company is responsible for? Um, it would be they would be responsible for any of your medical bills, your payments that are related to an approved IOD. So, if you seek treatment in some states um, outside of the met network, um, Cedric may refuse to pay for those benefits. So it's good to stay in the network in most states also for salary continuance because you only get salary continuance while you're on up uh, while you're being treated at a network provider okay so now we'll go on to the benefits um while you're out on an iod you are responsible for your personal insurance uh for as long as you're on payroll um and also the first 12 months of an unpaid status so once if you are out longer than the 12 months um, you will be direct billed from the company. Um, and after 12 months, if you're still out on the unpaid status, um, you will receive notification about COBRA. And as Kim as Kim that mentioned, you have the option of going to COBRA or go to the marketplace uh, to find insurance. And also, if you have any outstanding loans with a credit union or with a Fidelity 401, you need to make that phone call to try and see if they can make payment arrangements with you. 
Um, and lastly, it would be uh, long term disability. You need to find if you carry the long term disability, you need to file it within 12 months from the date of injury. So if you have any other questions or um, need to reach us, you can reach us uh, at, at IOD at APFA.org. <coughs> Or you can also visit our uh, department page on the APFA website. Alrighty. Thank you, Belia. Yeah. You're welcome. Moving on to uh, Hotel Michael Malou, Hotel Chair. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Of course, here our primary focus at the hotel and transportation uh, department is making sure that the company upholds the JCBA when it comes in regards to your transportation and your crew accommodations specifically section six, but there are other areas in the contract that do apply to your crew accommodations and your transportation. So if you find out that you're in a situation where your schedule or you're in an IROP or it's 3 a.m. in the middle of the night on a weekend and you need immediate attention, action and assistance, we strongly encourage you to reach out to the 24 seven hotel limo desk. On the slide is the number. If you do not have that number, go ahead and save it. Uh, they can help you relocate your room, set up your transportation, anything in that I need help now crisis moment, please give them a call. Your home, your sequence is completed and you're finally able to essentially process what just happened to you, please, and it is imperative that you report this to APFA. If you don't report it to us, if you post it on Facebook, we have no idea that this situation and contractual violation occurred or happened to you. Once you submit that information to the APFA hotel department, we immediately escalate it, document it, and research it with the company and the AA hotel limo desk and seeing what happened, what we can do to prevent it, help them figure out and help us essentially realize maybe what contractual violation occurred. They can help you file nods, whatever we need to do to, and then support that through a combination presidential grievance that was filed uh, in the summer a couple years ago, a year or two ago. Um, with the summer coming up and we know the uh, unpredictable weather that we may see. The hotel limo desk is being proactive. We are optimistically hopeful that there is a 138% increase in the agents that are on the desk. So in, in addition to that 130% increase, the supervisor headcount has also doubled. Now with that, um, a lot of the folks on the desk are not very educated in our contractual obligations and requirements. So please never hesitate to ask to speak to a supervisor, um, escalate over them. Um, we've heard and listened to some very interesting phone calls where there is some basic knowledge on their end that they are not aware of, um, such as long and shorts um, and hotel allocations. So if you ever and you know want to get into those encounters, please escalate and then after make sure you document for us. Um, their goal, which has been communicated to APFA, is that there's going to be three shifts throughout the day um, with a anticipated headcount of 15 to 20 agents on that desk. So when you're not in an IROP and it's not the middle of the night and you know you're bidding, you're looking at the bid packet, you're looking at hotels, um, you know you have a normal sequence and you encounter any issue, any problem. Um, also, if you have any feedback that you want to share with our department, please, please submit an APFA hotel feedback form. Um, that helps us and the team track what's going on, kind of look at trends, look at um, what markets that we need to visit, escalate that issue and supply that data to the company to improve your crew accommodations and your transportation. Um, we do stay very busy reviewing our incumbent properties across the entire system, as well as looking at new opportunities. We're always hoping to improve upon what we have. Um, as you can, I think a couple of weeks ago, there was a large announcement from network planning in regards to sort of seasonal flying going to year round flying, um, new routes being added. Um, you know, especially for those IPD flyers, if you see a market that you're very passionate about and that you fly often and you see a network scheduling, planning, and addition change, 
that is going to impact the amount of room nights that are needed in a market, which are then triggers us to drive either new hotels, gives us more buying power in a market. So these are what we have coming up in the next, I think, month, month and a half. So if you see a layover here that is interesting up to you, that you fly often, that you're passionate about, positive or negative, please let us know. Um, that gives us a good understanding of the membership feedback when we enter these uh, markets on a site review. Do you want to leave? Do you want to stay? I know it's uh, very easy to submit negative feedback, but if we go blindly into a market such as Inchon, you love the hotel, there's no problems. Well, let us know you love it. Let us know you want to stay there. If we don't have that feedback, we're going to assume that, okay, well, maybe we found a better property, a better location, a more JCB compliant hotel. Let us know, submit that feedback. So here's what we have on the radar. Um, we are working hard to make sure that hotel limo is on top of the contract, um, that they are following all the rules, regulations, and requirements. And also, on the other hand, we are looking to constantly improve our current contracted and allocated hotels. So now I'm going to pass it off to Ali Mallis. <laughs> Hello everyone, Allie Mallis here with our Government Affairs Department. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the APFA Negotiating Committee teamed up with the APFA Government Affairs Department in Washington, D.C. Um, for a lobby day. We had 38 appointments um, and it's a good chance we met with your representatives because we met with the uh, both Senate offices in our 10 base states as well as any House district with over 200 APFA members in it. Um, the point of the lobby day was to update them on our contract negotiations and to let them know um, how it's going so that when it comes time and things get a little more heated, that they're aware of where we're going. And a lot of them want you to have, um, you know, good wages, good jobs in their district. So they're invested in, in uh, making sure that APFA gets a good contract. Um, and they were very interested to hear a lot about our contract as well. Um, we also talked about short staffing in our industry and how that not only affects the operation, but our quality of life. We also asked them to co-sponsor the Protection from Abusive Passengers Act, which is the TSA no-fly list bill. So if there's a passenger who is convicted of assaulting a flight attendant on an airplane, they would lose their flying privileges um, under a TSA-mandated no-fly list. Um, more on the Protection from Abusive Passenger Act. We have Senator Jack Reed, Representative Eric Swalwell, and Representative Brian Fitzpatrick to thank for reintroducing this bill in this Congress. And at the end of March, one of our flight attendants, Pete Enriquez, spoke at the U.S. Capitol and talked about an experience um, on his flight where he was punched by a passenger. This is unacceptable behavior. Um, so we have a call to action and we need your help to get your members of Congress uh, co-sponsors on this bill. That's the one click campaign that went in the hotline and we'll make sure that that's handy for you here as well. It's actually we've reached 99% of our goal, but we should surpass it. We should get much higher um, until we get more co-sponsors on that bill. Um, we're hopeful that this will be part of the FAA reauthorization bill, which is a broad bill um, that will cover many uh, aviation issues, but it's in these bills that it's really these big group bill of how legislation actually gets passed in Congress these days. So in addition to that no fly list portion, we'll also be asking for um, alcohol signage in airports to let passengers know that if they're inebriated, they may lose their ability to get on their flight, um, as well as ensuring that crew self-defense training is compensated, um, since that appears to be something we're going to need to be um, armed with now on our flights. And also when passengers are fined for uh, violating a uh, crew member instruction or anything like that, um, where does that money go? And it typically goes into a general fund at the FAA. We're proposing that that money gets put into a health and wellness fund that will help flight attendants who've been affected with uh, medical bills, mental health bills, with um, ability to show up in court and testify against their assailant and those travel fees and accommodation fees that go along with that. Um, 
And if you're involved in an abusive passenger incident, uh, the FAA has recommended that in addition to submitting the company surge report, that you can also file a cabin ASAP report. And that report will go directly to the FAA. Um, and our safety department has mentioned how important it is to report, and I will echo that, um, whether it's smoke odor fume, hot cabins, the government affairs department needs data to try to change laws and regulations. Um, so please fill out those reports um, and to help us change those laws. And finally, um, the APFA PAC, this is how we get things done in Washington. It is a voluntary um, contribution that you can make. And this is how we make sure that the uh, members of Congress who support flight attendant issues can continue to serve in Congress. Um, how we thank them for introducing bills like the Protection for uh, Use of Passengers Act. And so we're um, really growing the pack here, but we're still only at a 5% participation rate from our membership. And um, most of the new hires who are coming into the building are signing up for the PAC. Um, so I hope you'll to report higher percentage uh, participation at our next membership meeting. Um, and that can be, you can complete that at www.apfa.org slash PAC. It'll just take a second. And as a token of our appreciation, you'll get a little APFA pack um, notebook here. And if you have any questions at all, um, we'd love to hear from you. Love to hear what you're thinking. Send us an email at legislation.apfa.org. Great. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> Great information. All right. Moving on to archives with uh, Jennifer Brissett. Hi, everyone. Um, before I go to the slide and what I'm working on right now, I just wanted to give a quick little history on the archives department. Um, many of you don't know that we do have an archives department. It was established in 1998 and it has the largest, it is the largest repository of flight attendant memorabilia and documents on the flight attendant profession, as well as APFA's history. Going back to before when we were APFA, when we were Alyssa and TWU. Uh, we went digital in 2018, so everything has been digitized. We have millions and millions of pages of documents, um, contracts that date back to 1947. We have um, bid sheets that date back to the 50s. We have um, negotiations materials, contract materials. We have memorabilia sent to us from flight attendants as they retire. Um, we also... Um, Let's see, we um, have, we still, I would like if you have any documents or anything that you would like that you think may have a historical significance, please send that in to us at APFA. And um, right now what I've been working on is every communication that the company sends um, flight attendants. Um, since 2015, I have been archiving that. I've completed 2015 and 16, and I'm in the process of doing 2017, um, and will continue until we're current. Um, we received several boxes from um, our former uh, JSIC uh, committee and um, other uh, memorabilia that I've received from flight attendants. And so I have scanned all of those and am in the process of archiving those. Um, I'm also going through some past election um, info from um, department and um, board chair um, elections and executive committee meeting minutes and board uh, minutes. Um, and I'm archiving those just to get current. And um, that is what I've been working on now. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, all right, we're going to move on now to uh, EAP, and actually Josh is going to do the presentation on uh, EAP, EAP today. Hi everyone, uh, thank you all for being on today. Unfortunately, <laughs> Dad and Marcus weren't able to be on today through, for the EAP department. They're currently conducting a new representative training for new EAP representatives, which is really exciting. Um, so this first slide, uh, Highly encourage you to take a screenshot of this or save this number in your phone. You never know when you may need some support. Um, first off is the EAP. It just basically they provide emotional support and assistance to flight attendants and, their, and your families. If you have something going on in life, you really need some support, uh, please reach out. They are trained professionals. They can help you get to a, a resource that is also covered under your insurance. 
professional standards is under the EAP umbrella as well. And it's basically a self help tool um, to help our uh, our flight attendants and uh, pilots resolve any incidents or uh, conflicts that you may arise when you're working. Uh, they're, they're able to help you resolve any of those issues uh, without getting management involved as well. Um, and last but not least, the critical incident response team. Uh, this is in the event you have a critical incident on board the plane. It's a debrief um, style program to help you work through any workplace trauma or any issues that may have happened. Um, we also have the flight attendant drug and alcohol program, commonly known as FADAP. And this program is also by trained professionals to help in the event uh, anytime in your career or life that you may have issues with drugs or alcohol. Um, this program is there to help get support and the help that you may need. And uh, once again, our trained EAP representatives are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week calling the new confidential phone line 833-214-2002. Please save this number on your phone. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you, Josh. On now to our National Ballot Committee uh, with Adam Brooks as our NBC chair. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again today for one of these important updates. Uh, I want to just go over our last recent election. So March 9th, we had our 2023 base representative election. So I just want to share a little bit of data with you so you can kind of see how that unfolded. So uh, we mailed out 19,240 ballots to six bases. Um, and if you look at the left there, those are undeliverable numbers. So that means that those were just probably bad addresses. They, those ballots were returned back to our vendor. They're reported as being unable to be delivered. Uh, the NBC is required to reach out to those numbers, which we did either by email or phone, advising them, hey, your ballot was undeliverable. Please let us know if you have a different address. Reach out to yes selections if you need to do put the ballot. The number right below that is uh, the duplicate ballot request. We had 141 members reach out for a duplicate ballot for a variety of reasons. Either they never received their original ballot, maybe they moved, maybe they messed up their ballot. Uh, and you can see there we have uh, 12 people who did two plus requests. Uh, we had approximately about 30 flight attendants reach out directly or indirectly to us at the NBC, just you know, advising us that there's an issue, I still have never received my ballot. Uh, there might be more than that out there who didn't reach. Um, and then you'll see to the right there, uh, we had 6,823 ballots received for the election. Unfortunately, it's a little bit lower of a participation number than we'd like to see. 35% uh, uh, of those mailed out were returned. And that 81.6 uh, of those ballots were eligible. That means dues eligible. And 18.4% were ineligible. Uh, and that kind of brings us to real quick before I move on, though, there is a point I want to make, and it's important to note that we are still conducting these representative elections by mail. And it's important to recognize that the U.S. Postal Service is unfortunately it's not what it used to be um, when it comes to mail delivery. There are systematic issues that are affecting union elections across the country. It's not confined to any one state, any one area or region. Um, it's just it's a problem. Mail delivery is a problem. It's slow. It's it's just it's it's a problem with our personal lives and it's affecting mass mailing such as union elections. It's also important to note it was not a widespread problem for us in this last last election, but we did see some problems with that experience and, and it's not uncommon. All the other unions are experiencing that that are still conducting paper mail balloting. Other election vendors are also experiencing it, so it is a problem. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're going to do to to hopefully correct and get back on track with that. All right, so here's a little quick overview of a breakdown of the 6,825 ballots received. You can see the eligible numbers are in the dark uh, blue there to the left and then the right are the ineligibles. And that's just important to note. That gives you just a little bit of an idea and flavor of where we're at. It's important to know you have to be in good standing to vote. So when these ballots are received in a paper ballot mail election, we scan that outer envelope that has the barcode on it. Uh, if you happen to use your own return envelope, we would try and verify it via your name or address on the outside. Uh, so you have to be in good standing. And if you're not 
maybe a lot of these people are not aware our members that you're in bad standing. It's important to check that by logging into the My Account section of APFA.org. It very clearly shows up at the top now if you uh, have a balance owed or if you are dues arrears. Dues arrears part is what makes you not eligible to vote. So that would be more than 60 days and that would cause you to be dues arrears. I'm going to talk a little bit about quickly just a high quick overview of some of the initiatives uh, we're going to work on for this year into next year. Uh, just so you can see it there, we secured on-site ballot storage. We're required to maintain everything election related for a year, so we're able to have a very secure uh, spot on-site in the office. So we no longer have to pay for a storage unit. Uh, we completed a thorough review of the 2023 base election. That's standard practice. Looked for areas we can improve. Um, we've also changed to an automated process for our willingness to serve candidate and reference eligibility verification process. So when we collect those willingness to serve, we're now automating checking all of those candidates uh, uh, eligibility. Uh, in process, we're currently working with our yes elections vendor to return to electronic or hybrid voting. So when I just mentioned earlier, what are we doing to fix some of these? How can we get back? That's one of the most common questions we get. Why aren't we electronic voting? Some of our members may not have been here when there was an issue back in 2016 with the DOL who regulates the elections. Um, there's also an issue APA or Pilot Union had an issue too. They've also been paper balloting uh, since they had an issue as well. Um, so it's really important to note, I've mentioned it on other updates with you guys and hotlines, also our leadership here, that we are working with our vendor. We feel we have the right vendor in place to return to electronic voting. I'm happy to report that future non-representative elections we will be conducted by electronic or hybrid style voting uh, which is you know good for everyone to hear um, and then we are confident as i mentioned we selected the right vendor to help us return to electronic voting for our representative elections uh, we feel they have the right safeguards in place to meet those stringent uh, guidelines from the dol slash olms uh, which oversees union elections um, real quick, I just want to mention as well, uh, myself and Josh Black were able to recently take part in a very important listening session that was offered by the DOL and the OLMS. And the reason this is important because for years, the DOL has been very vague on these voting guidelines uh, as far as it pertains to electronic voting. So they put out uh, kind of an all call to the uh, election vendors, stakeholders like us, the union people who are generally interested in union elections and uh, electronic voting. And the reason they did that is they wanted to hear from these people because technology has changed so much in the last, you know, since we had issues in 2016 and stuff like that. Uh, the technologies for these vendors and safeguards have dramatically changed. So the DUEL has had it has a vested interest now in possibly putting out more more concrete guidelines and guidance, which will provide us, you know, that uh, ability to have that in place to be able to return to that. So that we're working on it very hard. It's very important to us. It's the top priority for the NBC. We're going to make that happen for you. So uh, just look for that. Um, also, we're working on just finishing expanding and working on our NBC guide manual. That's important because we need a playbook. We need something in place for my committee that we can go off of when we run elections and quickly reference stuff. Also, you'd be happy to know if you're ever interested in running for office, the willingness to serve form, or if you're a current uh, uh, officer or hold a role, or you ran for a role, you you know we're happy to report moved on years ago from paper to electronic. It's an electronic form that we've used the last several elections, but we need to improve it. So that's something we're researching and working on right now to offer a better willingness to serve process where you can save your willingness to serve form, continue to work on it, and just an all around better experience. And thank you again, and thanks for tuning in today. All right, thank you, Adam. Um, thank you to all of our department chairs, our reps, for such a thorough uh, presentation today. Uh, Hope you as our members uh, appreciate all the updated information. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone again the importance of wearing your union pin, your APFA lanyard, and attaching those bag tags to your luggage. Because again, we can't do this without you. 
and solidarity at this point as we are getting close to uh, hopefully the uh, end of negotiations and reaching a TA. We'll need everyone's participation um, and solidarity in uh, achieving our new contract that we all know we deserve uh, and we've waited long enough. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us today and um, fly safe. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.